Welcome back. Making good pay decisions requires having an understanding of the full context of the culture and human capital issues that fall under the CEO's leadership. The best performing compensation committees know how to leverage their chief HR officer and the HR team to glean these insights. A good HR, chief HR officer brings knowledge of how, to drive, of how incentive compensation drives behavior and a broad understanding of capital, uh, human capital issues to the comp crow relationship. Before we begin, a couple poll questions. Which of the below areas does your compensation committee collaborate with the Crow to leverage their expertise? Select all that apply. Culture integration, talent strategy, employee engagement strategies, diversity and inclusion initiatives, director onboarding and education, none of the above. Second question, on a scale of one to four, Strategic Partnership. Please welcome Carol Surface, Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Medtronic, where she leads the human resources strategy for more than 90,000 employees worldwide. Prior to joining Medtronic, she served as Executive Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at Best Buy, and also held a series of human resources leadership roles at PepsiCo, including serving as Chief Personnel Officer for PepsiCo International. Let me also introduce Amy capellianti Wolf former Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Symantec. In addition to serving on the executive team and managing Symantec's global HR function, she led Symantec's workplace workforce strategy, as well as overseeing planning, real estate, and facilities. Amy also leads HR teams at Cisco, also led HR teams at Cisco, Sun Microsystems, the Walt Disney Company, and Frito-Lay. Moderating the discussion is Kelly Malafis, a founding partner with Compensation Advisory Partners. Kelly has 20 years of executive compensation uh, consulting experience, working with comp committees and senior management teams in a variety of industries, including financial services, insurance, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, and retail. And with that, I will turn it over to all of you. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kelly. I'm excited to be here with Carol and Amy to get the benefit of their experience as CHROs in, in today's environment. As Dan alluded to, uh, we've seen an evolution of the compensation committee and their role with an increased focus on human capital strategy and the impact on the organization. We've even seen the SEC asking for more disclosure for organizations around human capital measures um, to help investors understand the strategy which is really um, a very, very new concept. And while the focus and the primary responsibility of compensation committees is executive comp and pay and pay structures, we find that comp committees make the best decisions when they have context around what's going on in the broader organization and who better to provide that information than the CHRO. And so let's, let's get started. Um, Amy, let's start with you. With the oversight of human capital strategy becoming more and more critical, how has your role as CHRO evolved in working with compensation committees and the full board of directors? Well, I think you, uh, you actually referenced it. Um, I think way back when it used to be very transactional. You talk about very, very uh, compartmentalized discussions related to executive comp and performance at the top of the house. But what now is happening in these compensation committees, and this has been, I think, a, a, it's an emerging over the last several years, it's not just happening now, but a more systemic view of the organization, the business context of what's occurring in the business, um, succession around key and critical roles, so you don't let, you aren't left without, you know, important roles being filled, um, retention, diversity, um, pay and performance related to equity and um, in terms of uh, pay gender. So lots of different things have come into fold related to the overall talent landscape and not, it's not just about comp. And if you think about it, talent and comp come together very strongly in a sense, in a sense. And so it's actually even into the broader board construct. So it's not just the comp committee handles all things related to compensation. It's now become a board discussion. 
Uh, and it's everything from reporting out quarterly on performance related to culture, DEI, and it's also into everything from you know how did you actually uh, relate your paying performance to getting to the outcomes you wanted to drive towards. So it's a bigger, much more holistic conversation than I've seen right. in the past. Yeah, and I, I would agree it has been an evolution. You know, succession planning, talent management have, have always been on the minds of the board members, uh, but it's just become so much more um, enhanced and um, emphasized and the issues that you raised. H how about you, Carol? What, what, what do you see? Yeah, look, I think Amy really described it well, and, and it, it's a much more holistic conversation um, that's rooted in, you know, what is, what are we trying to achieve strategically? And, and rarely, uh, you know, someone that I used to work for, who is now a director on uh, a few different boards of publicly traded companies says, you know, I, I, I find it a very rare occasion when, uh, when a board or a management team is talking about strategy that you don't in, get into the conversation of what is and, and who, what type of talent, what type of capabilities do we need to help us actually achieve that strategy and deliver against our expectations, uh, number one. Number two, what is the culture that is going to enable us to achieve it? And then what type of incentives do we need to ensure that management is engaged and, and, and appropriately incented to, to achieve these goals? And, um, you know, in fact, about a year ago, uh, I was uh, engaged in a, in a study that included the perspectives of CEOs and directors of boards of publicly traded companies and, and actually asked the question of, you know, what do you expect from your, your CHRO and, and what are the capabilities that you're looking for? And, you know, overall, uh, the, the answers were, we need a CHRO who really can be the board's leader of human capital. And, uh, you know, they built that out and said, look, uh, we absolutely need to have the perspective of the CHRO to, to build shareholder approved executive compensation that needs to reflect the full gamut of all stakeholders, including employees, but the, the broader remit of, uh, of executive compensation and the governance aspects. Um, the second aspect that was identified was a CHRO who's going to help us plan and support CEO and senior executive succession. Of course, it's the board's responsibility, but we need the CHRO to help us lay out that, that process. What's the future profile of the CEO that we're looking for? And, and to ensure that we execute this process in the, in the time frame and the timeline that we are planning to do that. Um, and then finally, this notion of being able to surface and respond to external trends and be able to put plans in place to respond to those trends. And I think this past calendar year has really highlighted yeah. how that role has uh, materialized, right? Between what is the response and how do we handle a pandemic? What are the implications from a, a compensation and incentive plan standpoint? How do we help protect the employee base and ensure that we're taking all of the appropriate actions? And then of course, uh, you know, racial and social injustices and, and how the whole diversity, equity and inclusion agenda uh, gets, gets handled. So um, that's, that's one frame of reference. And I really do think you know, it's broadened the aperture much beyond just uh, what used to be solely executive compensation to a much broader remit, um, as I just described. Yeah, um, you know, just keeping with uh, your comments around, um, you know, the pandemic and the response of the organization and the comp committee's role, um, what, what would you see as the top priorities? You, you know, you mentioned some, you know, um, diversity and inclusion and, and equity. You mentioned the outcome on the incentive plans. Would you say, you know, talent retention, employee well-being? Kind of what are some of the top priorities, especially given the pandemic? Yeah, a great question, uh, Kelly. And I do think, um, you know, it depends a bit on, I'll, I'll speak from Medtronic's perspective, you know, different industries have faced different challenges. And so clearly, 
you know, if you're in the travel and airline industry, yeah. um, really tough decisions needed to be made around furloughing employees and so on and so forth. Um, for, for us, we were in a position where we've got, uh, you know, a healthy company, um, liquidity, uh, all of those, those positive aspects. And we also just happened to be completing the CEO succession process with a new CEO stepping into the role in the midst of this pandemic. And so you can really see that the, the three roles uh, of the board's leader of human capital kind of coming together here. So the context was new CEO stepping in and, and really felt quite strongly that our role needed to be to, to provide a level of income protection for our employees, number one. Number two, do absolutely everything that we can to invest in their health and their well-being, uh, to, to make sure that they had confidence in the future of Medtronic, and to be able to support both them and their families uh, to at least uh, kind of withstand the, the more challenging phases of the pandemic. And so we made a lot of investments in supporting our employees in responding to the pandemic in that way. And, you know, I would just say uh, the, the directors on our board or, or many of whom are sitting CEOs or recently retired CEOs who came from different industries where, you know, the context wasn't the same. And so I think, you know, one of the most important aspects is really understanding the organization and business context that we're coming from. And our directors, you know, may, may have had a different point of view about our new CEO's position, which is I'm going all in and, and investing in the engagement and the support and the, in protecting the income for our employees. And uh, uh, because I believe that's going to hold us in good stead as we exit the pandemic and that level of loyalty and engagement will, will really be important. Clearly, we had to make different decisions in responding to uh, incentive compensation because of our fiscal years were timed in such a way that we were forced to make difficult decisions around incentive compensation because our fiscal year ended at the end of April. And as a result okay. of that, our fourth quarter, primarily two, two months, uh, was quite heavily impacted by the pandemic. And as a result of that, our short-term incentive payouts uh, were zero. Coming back to this, this point around supporting employees, our, our incoming CEO had a real strong point of view that we needed to adjust that short-term incentive payout for 63,000 employees uh, to an adjusted payout, not 100%, something less than that, along the lines of ensuring income protection, but at the same time holding, you know, a pay for performance culture yeah. and saying, look, I'm not putting myself or the senior executive team into that category. We will, uh, you know, not retroactively adjust anything for that senior executive population. So really the point being, you know, balancing, balancing the, the new CEO's incoming perspective, how we responded to those external events, with a framework around the importance of broad-based employees, but still holding senior management accountable um, to the incentive plans as they played out and not doing any sort of adjustment or positive discretion. Yeah, I mean, you described very well the conundrum that, that many companies are facing where you have employees, you know, maybe working harder than ever, right? But the challenges in the economy, are impacting the financial results. So how do you balance, um, you know, re employee retention and motivation with the shareholder experience? So it's, it's, it's certainly uh, something that I think all of the uh, conference attendees are struggling with um, right now. And you, you had to make the decision earlier than others. Um, Amy, from, from your point of view, what are some of the, the top priorities um, of the CHRO, do, do you, are, are they similar or different or? Well, I, th I think um, the good and bad of this, of this pandemic is I think for those who are HR practitioners, it's been our time to shine or to, 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 to not. Uh, and I think people are realizing the real, the, the real juxtaposition between business and people. And so from an H CHRO perspective, 
I think we have been really focused on how do we keep the business in a place where it is um, sustainable and it's resilient and it can perform during this time. And then how do we make certain our employees are back to what Carol was saying are are sustained in their practices. So I think the head of HR role has become one much more, um, I think it's always been data driven. So I don't subscribe to the fact that HR folks have never been data driven, the good ones are. But I think it's incumbent upon us to be slightly ahead of the business to think about the downstream impacts of decisions related to furloughing, to cutting pay, to uh, taking down real estate and either forcing people home and in some locations, that's really quite untenable based on the size and the internet capability. Um, and also looking about things like retention and engagement. And what becomes particularly taxing right now is this notion of inclusiveness, because we've already struggled with that anyway when we're face to face. And now we're all on the phone with managers who perhaps don't have the, the, the ability to kind of bring people together in a different way. So I think the, the head of HR job has become much more operational than it ever has been in the past. And it's the forefront of talking about how you think about the financials, but also back to Carol's point, how do you keep people for the long term? Because yeah. people are going to remember how they were treated yeah. now, five years from now versus today. So I think it's really incumbent. Every decision that's made, we understand what the impact is to that, to that uh, constituent. Last thing I'll say is we also have to think about different ways to think about benefits. Um, Child care is super important right now. Um, how do you think about um, you know, mental health um, benefits? How do you think about elder care? All the things that were off to the side that we kind of did because it was table, you know, it's sort of how you ran your business has now become incredibly much, you know, incredibly forefront and we have to be ahead of that as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I want, thank you, Amy. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what information should the comp committee be asking the CHRO about? What are some of the key metrics? What, what data should, should they know um, to, to be effective in their job? But before we do that, we do have our poll questions answered, and I think that this will lend itself to, to that question. So the first um, poll question was, which of the below areas does your comp committee chair collaborate with the CHRO to leverage their expertise? So the first was culture culture integration, and that was 17%. The next was talent strategy, 32%. Employment, employee engagement strategies, 13%. Diversity and inclusion initiatives, 23%. Director onboarding and education, 15%. So I think, you know, we, we, we talked about talent, um, and so that came to be the highest, but um, Amy and Carol, from, from your perspective, um, does this resonate with, with what your um, comp committees are asking about and what they should be asking about? Uh, yeah, I, th I think we should throw the kitchen sink in there too while we're at it. <laughs> we, we think about the number of things that is on their mind. But yeah, I would say absolutely. It's everything from um, just overall sort of what's happening in the business and what's the impact on your employees to what are the metrics related to actual performance against objectives? Are you really measuring performance to how are you thinking about the, the culture and how people are working in the culture and, and what's it, what are the retention rates and the performance rates? So there's, there's so many levers to be pulled right now, but I, I, I have found that the comp community is especially important, especially critical to them is how are you treating the employee base and is that resolute to how you're treating the executive base? And if there's a big gap between the two, then there's a big problem because one, it morally is not right, but two, from a disclosure perspective, it's just, it's not, it's gonna hurt you in the long run. So they're really, I think there's a finer view to that. And I, Carol, did you wanna to add to that? Sure, you know, I, I would say um, just a consistent set of metrics and whether it's talent and succession um, and, and, and number of folks for pivotal roles, these are types of metrics that, um, you know, full boards, not necessarily just the comp committee ought to be looking at. And to the point around, you know, having the CHRO be the driver of culture and purpose um, in an organization then ties back to some of the inclusion and diversity aspects and to, being a, to be able to measure really quantitatively and uh, not over aggregate data to hide where there may be challenges, 
I think is a really important aspect to then be able to say, you know, boy, in, in aggregate, uh, such and such company looks like it, it's, it's an inclusive culture and it's driving the type of behaviors and employees are reporting in a positive way. But if you over aggregate, I think boards ought to be asking, but where are their problems? And where do you really need to, because it can't be all sunshine and rainbows. There's, there's yeah. got to be pockets or areas of the organization that you need to work on um, would be, you know, my recommendation. And I think, you know, another question that ought to be asked is, well, then how are you holding leadership accountable, line leaders accountable for, for driving to, to Amy's point around the performance metrics, for driving the type of, of culture that you're looking for? Um, you know, so these would be some of the metrics, whether it's done through, uh, you know, cultural or engagement surveys, uh, you know, annual succession plans, and the performance metrics ultimately of the, of the leadership team. I think these are some of the things that, that uh, boards and committees ought to be looking at. Then, which raises the question of if, how are we holding executives accountable and should some of these aspects be included in incentive comp? or are they better served in kind of your your day-to-day -day or yearly a performance evaluation that may or may not tie to either short or long-term yeah. incentives and i think uh you know on the topic of esg that's where many of us are are questioning you know how far and how fast do you go with esd esg type of metrics formally linked to incentive cop whether it's short or long-term and I'm sure there are a variety of perspectives on that topic, and we're, we're seeing that play out certainly uh, across industries, across the Fortune 100, 200, 500. If I can just jump in uh, yeah. on, on Carol's point, back to what you show the comp committee and the board. Um, there's, there was times in the past where you showed them just the, 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 the meta metrics, which really didn't get into the heart of the issues and concerns. And in mo most recent discussions with the compensation committee and board, we've gone as far down as to what are choke points related to diversity and inclusion related in terms of people being able to get to a particular position and then they can't, they reach their ceiling. So we're showing, I believe, a level of detail uh, that has never been shown in the past because, you know, glossing over, it's not going to fix the problem. And the board, the good boards are very interested in this and they, they really want to engage and understand it versus just sort of being reported out to. So it's a more of a working collaborative kind of relationship than just we're just going to be governance and hear the report and not really respond to it. I have an example actually, uh, Amy, that I just thought of on that point, which is on the topic of pay equity, which is clearly directly related to the remit of the compensation committee. And uh, last year we went through the exercise of disclosing aggregate pay equity by gender, you know, globally and by, by country. Um, along with our uh, ethnic diversity pay equity in the United States. And exactly to Amy's point, although the numbers for us were good, you know, 100% in some cases, 99% in other cases, the conversation with the compensation committee went, went to a level of granularity around what type of job families do you have issues with? So let's look at sales where there is not that, you know, 100% pay equity, it is something less than that. And then what are you doing within that particular cohort of employees to fix that? So I, th I think that is a good example of that level of a micro analysis and not letting an over aggregation of data uh, be all that you communicate with your compensation committee. They, they need to understand um, you know, at a micro level of analysis where the, where the good spots are and, and where the opportunities yeah. are. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, Amy and Carol, I, I have found that when uh, management is proactive about sharing this information and uh, being detailed about where the um, gaps are, um, it gives comp committees a, a level of comfort that, you know, this, this team's got it, right? It might not be perfect. There may be areas that need to be improved. Um, as opposed to why aren't we hearing about it or why is it so high level or, or you know, other things that are being, um, you know, hidden. And so the transparency I have found goes, goes a long way uh, with the comp committee. Um, so we, we do have another, uh, the poll results for the second question. Um, and it was on a scale of one to four is the timing of the interaction. What is the timing of the 
interaction between the comp committee and the CHRO? Is it infrequent was 13%, only before meetings was 13%, as needed was 40%, and frequently throughout the year was 33%. So frequently throughout the year and as needed, um, much higher than only before meetings and infrequent, which I think is great uh, because communication and transparency as we've been talking about is really important. Um, but Amy or Carol, what are some of the approaches that you have used to establish relationships and gain the trust and confidence of comp, comp committee chairs? Since that, you know, we've been talking about how important that relationship is. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, go ahead, go ahead Amy. No, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say building off of what the bridge that you just built, uh, Kelly, from the previous conversation, which is on this notion of of transparency, um, I, I would say, well, first of all, just getting to know the comp committee chair and having a, a personal connection, understanding backgrounds, perspectives, how you think about things is, is important versus just a transactional relationship is one. And the second point truly is transparency, is, um, you know, being able to communicate, I call it, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly um in a really transparent fashion um and so that there is confidence that you know management isn't isn't either trying to hide something or just paint this very rosy picture of 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 what's occurring which then would cause any uh director to say hmm, what are, you know what are they hiding or or you know when is the shoe going to drop about something that i haven't been told about so I think it is this, this level of transparency. And then uh, finally, you know, at asking for advice um, and, uh, you know, asking for advice and counsel, because I think this is a relationship where it's a very delicate balance of, you know, if I were a director, you don't want your CHRO uh, in a position where you're wondering whether they're just advancing the CEO's agenda and that they're pushing hard for a management perspective versus really understanding, you know, the broad stakeholder landscape. And that landscape includes broad-based employees. It certainly includes the executive team, uh, governance experts, institutional shareholders, um, and so on and so forth. So I think just um, building a relationship that's based on transparency, good judgment, and, and uh, making sure that there isn't a perception that you, you know, the CHRO is just trying to drive the CEO or management's agenda, um, you know, is, is, is an art and being able to establish that right out front is important. You know, I don't know if there's much more to add because I think you nailed it, Carol. I think it, it is an art and science. Um, because your role is to facilitate the relationship between management and the, the board related to how you're thinking about compensation and, and all the things we just described. And I think it's easy to get pulled from one side to the other. And I always found like my, my best relationships with the comp committee chair was ones that were steep, like in relationship, we spend time together, we troubleshoot together. Uh, we would try and triangulate because sometimes the CEO may be talking to other members of the board mm. related to compensation. So how do we make sure we're aligned and, and, and making certain there's, there's nothing that's out of context that could hurt the, 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 the relationship and or decisions that are made. I remember one time um, uh, we had a board member, it's actually our chair, talk to the CEO about you're creating a mercenary uh, environment because you're, you were all about making people rich versus really driving um, you know, performance based on merit and not just on making people rich. It was a really interesting conversation because the compensation committee chair and I had been talking about this. We've been coaching the CEO, and yet the CEO would come in um, with these, these grand, aggrandized views of how equity ought to work to make his, his, his peeps rich. And it, it, was, it, it started to erode the trust. And then when when the comp committee or when the uh, board chair said you're creating a mercenary environment, it was almost like we had talked to him about that and, and, and he stepped into it. So um, it, it's a lot of really, you know, triangulation, making certain everybody's on the same page. And if there's a disconnect, let's talk about it and not have something unfold in the comp committee meeting that could have been best discussed in, in advance of the conversation. So the, the meeting, you know, gets to the outcomes you want to drive towards. So there's lots of war stories. I'm certain Carol could talk, talk about this as well, but it, it is, 
sometimes you're the consigliere to the board and to the CEO, and you have to figure out what your role is in relationship to driving the outcomes you need for the business. Yeah, and and then to add to that, um, you also have um, the responsibility of working with a comp committee's independent comp consultant and making sure that um, the relationship there is is working effectively. So how how do you as a CHRO work with the independent advisor to make sure that you know management point of view is is represented so that the advisor is not making um, recommendations in a vacuum? Um, I'll go ahead and take this one um, uh, to begin with uh, very closely. So I've worked with uh, independent board advisors that have been very, very uh, board focused because that's they're hired by the board, but to the point where they're so uh, tight to the vest, it's been hard to kind of figure out what is, how can we find a common ground so we're both hearing each other related to what the management team wants and what the board wants. I've worked with others that have been open kimono, sometimes perhaps too much. And they have they have been in the position where they're 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 playing both sides of the game and that never benefits anybody. So I have found the best relationships one are ones that are transparent and ones where I'm like, help me work through this because I'm I'm not seeing what the, the board is seeing. So as mm -hmm. a, as opposed to having a conflicted discussion, it's more highly collaborative. Um, it's back and forth and it's using each other in support of what we're trying to drive towards you know, the outcomes. And, and back to Carol's point. It's hard because as a CHRO, you're part of the management team. So you have a seat that you're trying to, you know, support the CEO and their desires, but you also have to make certain you're supporting the shareholders and all the stakeholders and constituencies, constituencies you just uh, referenced. So that relationship with the board consultant, you know, can actually be very creative if you know how to work with each other and, and really kind of go through where you think there are gaps in, in the discussion. I think that's really well said. And, uh, you know, the way I come at it is, you know, reminding myself that, as Amy said, the compensation committee consultant is, is hired by and reports to the board, period. And that independent perspective and point of view has to be preserved and the, the board needs to feel like it is absolutely independent and, and not trying to simply you know, advance management's agenda. And so sometimes there are very, there are important but tactical indicators of that, which is, um, you know, ensuring that the compensation committee consultants materials are all of their materials and that, it, you know, it's not management's power of the pen. To Amy's point, um, um, having uh, frequent conversations, I think with the compensation committee consultant to ensure you know, this is where, this is what I'm hearing, you know, from employees, from executives, uh, from the CEO, you know, what have your latest conversations been either with the chair or the compensation committee, or how did that executive session debrief go? Are there, are there some, you know, pieces of feedback that we really need to take in, into consideration, you know, and especially as we were trying to navigate all of the, the impact of the pandemic around incentives, we were doing things really, uh, frankly, on the fly and ahead of so many other companies by virtue of the timing of our fiscal year, everybody was really trying to figure out things and, and write the playbook as, as we were going. So I think it is just this, it, it, it is being transparent and, and having the, the compensation committee consultant feel like they can very transparently share this is, this is the committee's perspective, this is management's perspective, and this is our independent perspective on how we might think about balancing the, the different stakeholder per perspectives here to get to the right outcome. And in some cases, then, you know, there, there's a conversation that says, look, we're, we're not going to be able to manage all uh, of the variety of stakeholders here or meet everyone's needs. In this particular instance, we're going to prioritize X. Um, so, you know, I just come into it reminding myself every day that they have a role to play and that independence is a really important aspect for the directors to feel like they've got confidence in and know that they're going to take management's perspective into consideration as well. Great. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're hearing is transparency and communication all around um, can lead to, to better, better outcomes. So it's really helpful. Um, so we do have an audience question that came through um, for either Amy or Carol. 
how do you define the outcomes you are trying to achieve? And then how do you measure them and share progress to the compensation committee? Um, I'm assuming this is from a human capital, human capital perspective. I think it comes back to the metrics that we talked about, uh, whether it's under the talent dimension or advancing the culture dimension or pay equity as an example. So, I, you know, those are a few examples of, you know, look, if, if our goal is to achieve pay equity in aggregate for gender globally and, and for different ethnicities within the US, um, let's continue to report on that. Success looks like pay equity. And then to the previous conversation at a granular level and not just in aggregate, but mm -hmm. you know, in some of these other areas, whether it's sales or operations where, where we, not may, we may not have reached pay equity yet. Similarly, you know, on culture, if we're wanting to build a, an inclusive culture where truly all diverse talent can thrive, then what does that look like? So I think, you know, aligning the overall strategic imperatives along with the metrics to be able to inspect what you expect is, is success and making sure that we're aligned on what those outcomes look like, both from a qualitative as well as a, a quantitative fashion. And then being able to report on that on a regular basis, whether that's quarterly, whether that's you know uh, every other board meeting, um, getting aligned on the timing of that as well. Yeah, ha have you seen that change um, in terms of the timing, Amy or, or Carol? I, I feel that several years ago, you know, talent might have been a one meeting annual uh, discussion, yeah. and I'm seeing a little bit more of these metrics creep into you know each comp committee meeting and also um, the full board getting um, a download from the CHRO on talent, d &I, pay equity. Is that something that you think is, is new or it's always been there, it's just more in the limelight now? Um, I, I, I'll go, I'll take this one. I think it's much more frequent now and I think it's, it's something that's probably evolved over the last you know, couple of years, maybe that last you know, 18 to 24 months. Um, I believe and I'm going to my soapbox for just one minute and I'll get off. But like we all focus on P&Ls, you know, revenue, uh, you know, number of customers attained, new logos. And, and we make those so critical and yet equally as critical are all the human capital metrics that Carol just referenced. And so now I'm seeing that as, much, as, as maybe not as much as important, but starting to get much more um, uh, uh, exposure and expectation and accountability into the board discussion. So I can tell you on a quarterly basis, we did report out on in employee engagement, work we're doing around cultural transformation, retention of key performers in pivotal roles, uh, DE&I, which unfortunately I, I don't feel like any company, I don't, I don't feel like all of us are doing as good as we'd like to do, but a much more in inspection as well as how can we help perspective than I've ever seen in the past. And I think you're going to see more of that in light of everything that's going on around us, but much more frequent report outs and also, you know, what are you going to go do about it? Not, hey, oh, that's a shame. Let's move on to the next metric. It's okay. What's your plan to go fix this? And, I, and, I, and I'm excited about that because I think that level of accountability helps us do our jobs more effectively. Yeah, absolutely. I would say the, the full board engagements on, on talent topics, talent, culture, diversity is, is what I've seen. And number one, number two, and at every meeting. So again, fresh uh, coming off of a CEO succession event uh, where the full board drove that process that was in every meeting. So four or five times a year discussion that included all of the metrics that um, Amy referenced in terms of, of other talent bench and, and culture uh, metrics. So I think that pattern uh, for us anyway will, will continue. And I think that's probably becoming perhaps more common is full board discussions versus just particular committees on broader talent succession and culture topics. Well, thank you both. This has been really helpful um, and very insightful and um, keeps your roles exciting, right? And on your toes, um, but we're at the end of the session. So I just wanna thank um, Carol and Amy for, for sharing their experience and expertise with us uh, today on our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. And with that, I'm gonna thank you, uh, Kelly, Amy, Carol, excellent session. We're now going to take a 25-minute break. 
So grab some lunch, check your email, and visit the Resource Center where you can find additional insights from our sponsors, NASDAQ, Pay Governance, Pearl Meyer, Meridian Compensation Partners, FW Cook, and Compensation Advisory Partners. You can also find content from the Corporate Board Member Institute, update your profile, and find fellow attendees to connect with. We're gonna reconvene at 12.55 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, please open the polls tab within the live discussion box and rate this session. Thank you, and we'll see you after the break.